Again, I'm excited to have Chad Bell present first today. Again, Chad is a farmer from Northwestern Illinois. I'm gonna let him introduce himself a little bit more here in a second. Um, and he's gonna be talking about some of his production practices with cover crops, as well as some economics. So Chad, are you ready to go? I think so. Can you hear me? Perfect, yes. All right, well, let's get started. Uh, so my name is Chad Bell. I'm a farmer from Northwestern Illinois in Mercer County. Uh, my county butts right up against the Mississippi River just south of the Quad City. So uh, many times wish I lived in Iowa, but that's a discussion for another day. Uh, so married with two kids. Um, my uh, knowledge, I guess, started from Illinois State University and then uh, started in ag retail, <clears throat> ag retail at our, uh, with our local FS for five and a half years. And then uh, in 2013, went back to the farm full time. So we raise about 1200 plus acres of corn, soybeans, uh, dabble in a little bit of wheat and uh, also raise some hay and contract finish 2400 head or have a 2400 head wean to finish barn for a local farm here in the county. Uh, so my grandpa Bell back in the 70s was named Mercer County Conservation Farm of the Year. So uh, I guess conservation has been something that we've uh, have felt is important on our farm for a long time. So just here back in 2012 was when I first got started using cover crops and been using them ever since. So the Red X is where the location of my farm is right around there is where we farm and um, the map on the right is just kind of the uh, plant hardiness zone for the from the USDA it just kind of shows you uh, where I'm at I guess as far as uh, growing conditions so very similar to the southern half of Iowa for sure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my experiences using cereal, cereal rye which is primarily the cover crop that I use. A little bit about my management programs and some tips for what I've come across and uh, using cereal rye and corn and soybean production. And then towards the end, talk a little bit about some economics of cereal rye for weed control and soybeans, which I think is very um, undersold currently. So, uh, some good things that I've experienced in corn uh, started out when I first got into cover crops, seeing some great erosion control and prevention from using cereal rye. And a lot of that was on soybean stubble. So we all know that how prone soybean stubble is to erosion, especially in the late winter and early spring. So I've always uh, tried to uh, push cover crop planting uh, right behind the combine or as close as I can as possible uh, to try to get something established in the fall. That way it's there for that early spring uh, erosion potential. Uh, I've also seen some improved soil tilth uh, and it's just just a little some slight changes in soil structure there in the topsoil right where you're putting that seed in and it's made for a nicer planting environment. Now, I don't know for sure if that has equated into yield gain or not, but it sure seems like it's a better environment to proceed to soil contact. And I believe, I, I really haven't done a lot of uh, trials yet. I'm gonna get a little bit better about that. Uh, checking or putting in some check strips on corn and soybeans but I, I feel that currently there's little to no yield loss and that's with proper management. So that's, that's the big thing. So some learning experiences, you can see this picture is a pretty good learning experience on the right. This field in particular was aerial applied and this was right up next to the end rows. I don't know exactly what happened, but my assumption is that the ap aerial applicator doubled up this little strip here along the edge of the field. And so you can see that with a doubled up rate of rye, it really choked out the corn. And so this 
this picture was also part of a cold, wet, cloudy spring. And so you couple several different factors together, you can you can have some issues that compound on top of each other and can cause some problems. Termination timing, this is just my, I guess my general thought is if the rye gets bigger than 12 inches and you're going ahead of corn and your forecast doesn't look very good and you don't have it planted yet to not terminate it because I've come across the scenario where I terminated some bigger rye first thing in the spring and got a cold and rainy forecast and next thing you know it was 30 days later and I was watching paint dry and trying to figure out when I was going to be able to plant corn into that stuff because it had fallen over and shaded the ground. It's a great great insulator if that's what you're you're after but if you're wanting to get crops planted it it doesn't work very well in that scenario. Army worm potential, there is a potential for that. So just monitor moth flights and uh, scout your fields. So my current program right now, I'm seeding cereal rye on 15 inch rows on an angle following the combine. I have a white, uh, white planter using wheat discs in that planter to seed the rye. And that works pretty well. Um, so I'm strip tilling my anhydrous in the fall with about 100 units. And then uh, coming back and planting corn on top of those strips in the spring. And I won't talk much about uh, my planter setup. It's pretty basic, really, since uh, we'll be talking more about that later. Uh, and then I spray my pre-emergence and rye burn down all in one pass following the planter. And that looks usually like 40 units of nitrogen and five gallons of ammonium thiosulfate. And also a full rate of Roundup, but there is antagonism and that's why I run the full rate and I still don't have 100% control, but it's uh, usually 85, 90%, which is still adequate, I feel, in my, in my situation. And then I follow that up with uh, 46 units of nitrogen is super U right around the V4 time frame. So some management tips that I have for corn, just what I've seen in my uh, nine years is uh, I like lighter or thinner seeding rates, but I also, like I mentioned, I'm trying to get that uh, seeded right behind the combine. And I think the earlier, earlier you can get it seeded, you can get by with a lighter rate just because it's got more time to tiller out before winter time. Um, like I mentioned, I use 15 inch rows. I prefer that over uh, drilling, which we have a drill, but it's only 15 foot versus a 30 foot 15 inch planter. So that's twice as fast. Also broadcast, I've done that and I've ended up with good results, but it also depends on their spread width and I, I just prefer 15 inch rows or, or getting the seed in the ground as opposed to just slinging it on top. I like to terminate it uh, eight inches or less in the spring or else uh, plant green. And if you're using just Roundup alone as a standalone pass, you can get by with 32 ounces of Roundup. I know I mentioned 44 ounces ahead of or before, but that was with liquid fertilizer. So antagonism is a real thing with that. And then uh, applying a minimum of 40 pounds uh, pre-emerge. And also consider strip till or bio strip till for a better planting environment. In this picture in particular is a strip till field of mine. You can see that uh, planting strip is clean of residue and clean of rye. So management tips, just some basic a basic program would be just to broadcast or aerial apply, terminate it first thing in the spring, no-till your corn and broadcast nitrogen, or a more advanced system uh, mimicking mine a little bit is using a planter to seed it post-harvest and then uh, plant green and terminate pre-emerge in the spring, strip till, and use uh, liquid on your planter, which I do not have currently. So 
some next steps, uh, hydraulic downforce. I'm going to that this spring with a different planner um, just to hopefully ensure better seed to soil contact and consistent planting depth. And for a starter, it's something I'm considering, haven't made that jump yet. Uh, I'm using more MESZ for the sulfur and zinc. Uh, started seeing some results using more sulfur and zinc. So looking to move more towards that with the dry fertilizer program. And then uh, manure, I think. Most people that I've talked with that have uh, access to manure, whether it be uh, hog or cattle or able to graze cattle on, on their cover crops, the manure is really a, a big game changer, uh, being able to have that uh, more natural fertilizer on the field. And you can see this picture, there's a distinct line in there uh, in the foreground is uh, hog manure ground and in the back did not receive hog manure, but the whole field had cover crop on it. So you can see that distinct line. So there's there's probably a tillage effect with the manure applicator a little bit. I mean, the, the picture looks like it got worked with a finisher or something, but all it had was the manure applicator and a strip till bar run through it. So definitely a big difference there. And it, it did equate into some yield difference there. Not necessarily decided on how I'm gonna terminate the spring, but uh, that's a bridge to be crossed, I guess, depending on what spring looks like. Soybeans, easier to manage, I have found, uh, and it's the simplest way to get started into cover crops, it seems like. Don't need anything fancy for planter setup. Uh, termination timing, I've found, is less critical. Uh, the more seed, you get better, better uh, coverage of the ground and more weed suppression. Uh, so water hemp's a big thing. I'm sure it is for everyone listening to and good uh, results using uh, cereal rye for suppression on that. And owning a sprayer definitely helps um, with your timing, spraying timing. And if you're really uh, doing some maybe unorthodox things outside of what an ag retailer would do with their custom application, that owning your own sprayer really helps. Learning experiences. Um, this picture had aerial applied rye and you can see it's got some pretty significant growth in the soybeans that we were harvesting. Um, it was probably eight inches. So we were trimming the rye off with the draper head and running that through the machine, which wasn't a big issue. Um, but we did have to, as soon as the dew came on at night, it was like you flipped a light switch and you just couldn't harvest anymore. I'm also doing some non-GMO soybeans. So um, I relied on Select Max to uh, burn down some rye this spring. And I knew how slow it was going to, or how slow it typically is, but unless you're using that as a standalone uh, burn down program, you really, you really don't realize how slow it is until you're relying on it solely. This picture is uh, of that non, one of the non-GMO fields I had this spring. I let the rye grow up through the soybeans and then terminated it. And you can see there is 20 days difference between that picture, add on another seven days prior to uh, termination and you can see how how slow it is and and killing it and degradation of the rye too. Current program, I'm planting 15 inch rows uh, on an angle similar to corn. Right now I'm spraying my residual first thing in the spring as a standalone pass, planting the soybeans and then terminating the rye with a quarter roundup in my roundup ready soybeans. And that's uh, usually right around that V1, V2 time frame, And then uh, coming back with another pass with uh, residual and uh, a little bit of Roundup for grass insurance. Uh, any successful program that I've seen in my area uh, requires you to either, or <laughs> you need to pull and spot spray field edges and your problem areas. That's 
that's very critical and I've seen good results with being uh, on top of that for the last few years. That's one of my big things that I that I do every summer. Management tips. Need a 40 pounds plus for good weed control. You could probably get by with maybe a little bit less uh, depending on when you're actually getting that cereal rice seeded. The earlier, the better. Uh, spraying a strong residual ahead of planting. Uh, if you're not wanting to make a separate pass, you could add your Roundup with your burn down or with your residual, and you could time that closer to your planting time. Now, there's several ways you could do that, but if you're like me and like to plant your soybeans uh, at the same time that you plant corn in mid April, then uh, terminating the ride mid April, you won't get the weed suppression out of it like you would if you waited till mid-May or late May, which could also tie into your planting window as well. Narrow rows because of earlier canopy. Uh, I plant green and not really anything special with planter setup either. And on my Roundup Ready acres, I follow the planter with the quarter Roundup. So basic program, you could just broadcast it or aerial apply into standing corn, which aerial works well. Um, I've had good and bad luck with it. And it's all about the rainfall and the timing, it seems like. And then terminating it first thing in the spring with your residual is all one pass. Or an advanced program similar to mine, you could plant post harvest with a planter or drill spray your residual first thing in the spring as a standalone and then terminate uh, later with Roundup or if you're uh, really advanced or wanting to do things a little bit differently, uh, you could use a roller crimper as well. My next steps, um, I'm thinking about a weed wiper attachment for my sprayer. That way I could use Roundup to terminate my cereal rye, my non-GMO soybeans. That was just kind of a off the wall thing that I had thought about. And I guess if anyone has any experience using that in that situation or just a weed wiper in general, uh, feel free to give me a call or send me an email or something with your experiences. I would love to hear that. Um, and a lot of that's because uh, the cereal rye would melt down and kill much faster than using select max and it's also a significantly lower cost too so just some things that i'm looking at roller crimper is also an option um, but it also requires a higher seeding rate or a thicker stand to be effective uh, the ones that i've looked at are expensive for a true roller crimper. So right now, at least in my opinion, it's not very cost effective for at least my operation as much as I would like to use one. I can't even find one locally to try. So that kind of eliminates that at least for the time being. Also allows for better sunlight sooner versus leaving the rice standing. And it's just a different, different mode of action really for uh, terminating your eye. So you're not necessarily relying so much on a chemical application. Cover crops and wheat. Uh, mentioned that I dabble a little bit in wheat, and uh, this was my picture. This picture was my first crop of wheat that I actually harvested. So, middle of July harvest timing, at least in my area, allows for nearly unlimited different options you can do uh, fall forages or uh, a diverse mix of just a cover crop. And it gives a great opportunity for maximizing your cover crop investment because we all know that cover crops can be expensive uh, depending on what you're doing and uh, at behind wheat would be a, a great way to get your money's worth with a couple extra months of growth out of it. This picture was a uh, sorghum sudan grass that I seeded right behind the combine for a, a neighbor to use to chop for cows. So now getting into the cereal rise weed control. Uh, hopefully I got didn't take up too much time ahead of time, but uh, I'm going to compare a couple different programs. 
and I'll try to go fast because this, I mean, you don't really need to see exactly what I'm doing, but just know that a, a Roundup Ready standard program, it's about 83 bucks an acre at full retail price uh, versus a cereal rye program on the right. You can see that I'm including seeding and planting. Um, so there's $8 an acre difference in uh, total weed control and seeding cost basically for those two programs. So that $8, $8 an acre increase, and uh, that's what it costs basically to include that cover crop into your rotation. Um, at least the state of Illinois right now, the last two years has offered a $5 an acre crop insurance discount. And I don't, I'm not familiar with Iowa, if there's programs available or what those look like. Also uh, with Cargill, who I uh, sell most of my soybeans to, they're paying up to $10 an acre for up to 200 acres of cover crop. So between those two different things, plus we're, you know, we're hearing a lot about uh, more uh, carbon payment programs. So between all of those things, you know, you can make a, make a pretty good uh, economical case for even just trying cover crops. It really shouldn't, in the end, it really shouldn't uh, cost you money out of pocket to at least try. Plus NRCS has programs and you name it, really. There's a lot of different ways to uh, get things started. So that $8, you know, it's an increase in cost, but look what it can get you. Nutrient sequestration, water holding capacity. And one of the best ones is you can get some funny looks from your neighbors and your retailer when you're telling them what you're up to. They, they tell you that they're glad that they don't spray for you sometimes. So here's a non-GMO program. Um, you see between the two programs, there's uh, not really a lot of difference because I'm, I'm assuming uh, these are my costs on the right, um, my exact program, what I used last year. Um, I didn't have to use the program on the left. So really my costs were a wash versus a standard program. So I should have updated this uh, cost or the uh, soybean price be before this presentation. I didn't do that. So there is some differences there now versus then, but uh, you can see between a standard Roundup Ready program with no cover crop versus a non-GMO soybean program with cover crops, um, there's $13 an acre difference in, in your overall program costs. So you can see on the right, I was assuming 1190 for fall soybeans delivered. Um, Non-GMO premium, at least in my area, is $1.40. So um, you can see at 60 bushel an acre, that's an additional $84 an acre in revenue. So you take uh, $13 in extra herbicide costs off of that. Plus, at least in my case, my seed cost is 20 bucks an acre less with a non-GMO seed. So I'm looking at an additional $91 in profit potential with non-GMO soybeans, assuming I'm yielding 60 bushel uh, on my Roundup Ready and non-GMO soybeans. So there's, if you have a market locally and feel comfortable using cover crops, um, I don't see a reason not to potentially try that. So with that, thank you for your time and my contact information is on there. So feel free to email me or give me a call with feedback from my presentation or uh, just let me know if you got any questions. Thanks, Chad. That was Wait, awesome. Was I good on time? You're great on time. We have plenty of time for questions. So there's a couple that are already in the chat box that I'm gonna fire off to you. And then if folks have other questions for Chad right now, feel free to put those into the chat box. But the first one I want to bring up is you mentioned going into corn that you're either trying to terminate 
your rye early or you're waiting and planting green. And someone asked if you can sort of expound upon the pros and cons of that uh, killing early versus waiting and planting green. Um, killing early pros, um, you, you save yourself potential headache from weather delays and also letting the, the cereal rye get big on you. Um, cons of killing early is that I've at least felt that, and it's, it's kind of a mental game, I guess, you know, you, you look out in the field and your cover crops just greened up and it's two or three inches tall. And you're, you're thinking to yourself, man, I didn't get much out of that cover crop this year, but at the same time, if you were to take a spade out there and dig some of that up, you'd see a pretty significant root system on there that isn't reflective of your above ground growth. And so that's something that I've struggled with is uh, that in particular is knowing when to just say, okay, this is the time I'm gonna terminate it. I've gotten all the benefit that I'm going to get versus waiting to terminate and running into potential issues with weather delays and, and like I mentioned the scenario where I terminated the rye that was big I wasn't sure if that was the right thing to do but weather was coming in and it turned out that I probably would have been better off to just let it go and have it help uh, pull some of that moisture out of the ground versus killing it and it shading the ground that definitely will not let moisture come out of the ground so there's there are some pros and cons. I guess it depends on your um, how comfortable you are with the management of it. Um, but if you're questioning uh, questioning at all, I guess I would go ahead and pull the trigger and terminate it, depending on size. But uh, it's it's a hard decision to make. I guess once you once you really get into it and have a passion passion for it, it's it's a difficult decision to make, honestly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, there's also a question here about manure. Um, so you mentioned wanting to incorporate more manure in your system and, and already applying some. So um, can you expand upon how you're applying manure currently? Yeah, currently um, I'm hiring it applied with a drag line with a, a pretty minimal disturbance toolbar. And so um, that's that's how I've been applying it, just custom applied minimum disturbance bar. And that way I'm not having to go back in behind the applicator and work any of the ground down. So it, it wraps it up a little bit, but by springtime it's mellowed it out pretty well. So I don't have don't have anything to any concerns with that. So in the future, um, when you're trying to incorporate more manure, do you think you'll use that same system or is there anything else you'd want to try with um, applying manure? Well, that's probably where I'll see myself at. Um, I do know of a guy in southeastern Iowa and it seems like more on the Iowa side, it's more popular, but using a, a, a tank to tank it on. And the one guy in particular that I've talked to, he has a strip till units on his uh, manure tank. So he's accomplishing building his strips and applying his, new, his manure all in one pass and, and using that manure fertilizer as his strip till fertilizer. So that in a perfect world without compaction, or at least my concern of compaction, that would be, that would be an ideal program for me, I guess. Great. Um, there's a question here about your wheat. Um, so can you clarify what your wheat row spacing is? Is the wheat on 15 inch oh. rows? And are you having any issues with weeds with that wide of spacing? Yeah, so that, that picture of the wheat was 15 inch rows and I used the same planter that I put in the cereal rye with. Um, I did have some weed issues this summer, but it was that had just purchased uh, the year prior. And so the weed history uh, was a little higher than uh, most of our other fields. And so I 
kind of knew that going in 15 inch rows, it might be a, might be an issue, but primarily it was a uh, giant ragweed. There was some water hemp, but um, after the combine, we let the field sit for uh, a couple days and then uh, sprayed any of the regrowth. So um, yeah, weeds, weeds were a issue in certain spots, but overall not, not as much as I expected in 15 inch row. And can you, um, you mentioned wanting to try a, a weed wiper and can you talk about more like what that is and what that would do? I'm, I'm very unfamiliar with it and I'm not sure if everyone else on the call already knows, but it'd be great to hear just a little bit more about like how that can help your system. Yeah, maybe I'll try to go back to that picture. But anyway, it's a, uh, looks like a, basically a sponge attachment for your sprayer. Yeah, that's an all right picture, I guess, but um, yeah, it's like a, a sponge system that you can either plumb up to your existing sprayer or there's um, booms that are more specifically for this weed wiper attachment. And I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but you mix a higher, a very high percentage of straight chemical with a low percentage of water. And so it's highly concentrated and basically you just run that um, through the through the weeds that you're trying to kill and that sponge will then leave chemical on that weed and kill it. Uh, so I've, I've heard about them being used in Southern Illinois for their higher water hemp pressure in Palmer Amaranth as well, uh, using mainly Gramoxone at a late stage in soybeans. So I, my thought was that this would potentially work considering that at the termination timing that I'm using, my soybeans are just a couple inches tall at the time and the rye is four or five, six foot tall. So unless my boom's dragging in the ground or something that, or the sponge is dripping Roundup off of it or something that that should work for terminating cereal rye. So that's kind of my logic behind uh, using that and a little bit about how I think it works, but I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent on it either. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it seems like you would have, like you said in the slide, you'd have cost savings if you did that because you're using on your herbicide. Yeah. Especially in my non-GMO soybeans. Um, since uh, Select Max is a higher cost uh, chemical and it's just slower to kill and and it's only gonna kill grass that's out there versus Roundup will kill, you know, some other broad leaves and other things out there too that it could be a cost savings and uh, just work better, I guess, in my situation, but I may be putting too much thought into it as well. I don't know. No, it's good to think about these things. It sounds great, but I don't know if it's practical. Well, Sarah asked in the chat um, if anyone's used one before. Um, Dave's shared that back in the 80s, we used a weed wiper with Roundup on volunteer corn and soybeans, and it worked great. So there's at least one um, anecdotal positive review for you. Um, and then I just have one more question, Chad, and then we'll hand it over to Becca. Um, someone asked if you had any issues with soybean cyst nematode, um, and if so, does the addition of cereal rye help with management of that pest? Uh, so I haven't done any testing for cyst nematode, um, but I do, with my soybean seed treatment, I do run, uh, the treatment I run does help with cyst nematode, so that's really the extent of my knowledge to it, but like I say, I haven't done any testing, so I don't, I don't have anything to go off of as far as if cereal rye has helped with the uh, cyst nematode pressure or not. And I don't, don't even know if I have it, but um, most, most people you talk to say everyone really probably has it. Some just have it worse. Great. Well, thanks, Chad. And I know, Chad, you're going to stick around for the rest of the boot camp. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate you sharing all of your management tips um, and what's worked for you and your system. This has been really helpful. And if folks have other questions for Chad, um, feel free to ask them in the chat box and we can get those back to him um, throughout the rest of the boot camp. So you can 
stop sharing your screen. Perfect. And then I'm going to hand it over, great, to Rebecca Clay, um, who again is the Strategic Initiatives Agronomy Coordinator at Practical Farmers of Iowa. And um, among many hats, she uh, works a lot with farmers in our cover crop cost share program and does a lot of um, full farm um, cover crop economics, which she's gonna share uh, today. So take it away, Becca. Thanks, Lydia. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the boot camp today. Um, I'm calling in from Sioux City, Iowa, Northwest Iowa. So, and it's snowing pretty good. So I know at least the farmers around here aren't doing too much field work. I saw a few farmers from Paulina and Cherokee, this area. But um, so as Lydia mentioned, my name is Becca Clay and I'm the Strategic Initiatives Agronomy Coordinator at Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, whoops, skipped ahead. So, uh, we know that cover crops have a lot of benefits, um, including being really critical for soil conservation, maintaining our field productivity, especially with these kind of upcoming future inclement weather events that we're seeing more and more of. Um, some people are using cover crop for forage, for grazing. Um, and we also know that cover crops are really critical for maintaining good water quality. Um, so, uh, I'm sharing some data from uh, the 2020 Van Zandy Creek watershed. Uh, we were collecting um, some water quality uh, data with Iowa Soybean um, and the Van Zandy Creek watershed is in um, Southeast Jasper County in Iowa. And this particular graph is showing nitrate concentrations in water from tile outlets from a few different fields in the watersheds. In the watershed. Um, five of these fields were entirely cover cropped which is kind of the green dot that we're seeing here. And um, 10 of the fields, uh, or excuse me, 10 of the tile outlets were draining from fields that were entirely non-cover cropped, which are kind of displayed with the black dots here on this graph. Um, and since last year was so dry, tiles weren't uh, running, you know, throughout the year, throughout August and September, we saw kind of a drop off in um, uh, tile outlets that were flowing. Um, but you can kind of see the general trend here, which is that nitrate levels for our green dots, um, which are our cover crop fields, um, are uh, significantly lower than samples from the tile that was draining from our non cover crop fields. In fact, um, on average, they were our tile draining from uh, cover crop fields were on average 32% um, lower in nitrate loads than our non cover crop fields. Um, and this number is pretty much in line with research that's coming. Uh, from other parts of the states as well. Um, and of course, this is really important for our ecosystem, but from a production perspective, we know that ultimately, if we're not losing that nitrogen uh, via nitrates from our tile drainage, then that nitrogen is gonna stay in the soil and eventually be available to us. So this is um, both important for our ecosystems, but also important for our production. We were also wondering, you know, what does the nutrient loads in the stream uh, that these tile outlets drain into or feed into? Um, and so we monitored stream segments coming from four sub watersheds with different rates of adoption in of cover crop. Um, we had one that had 0% cover crop. We had another that was 19% cover crop, another that was 36% cover crop, and another that was 62% cover crop coverage. Um, and, you know, Unsurprisingly, uh, the two sub watersheds with the highest nitrate concentration uh, were the two watersheds with 0% cover crop and 19% cover crop. Um, so that we confirmed again that cover crops are an important tool for water quality. Um, however, you know, water quality is very important, but it doesn't necessarily directly impact our cash flow on any given year. Um, but what can help us cash flow is using cover crops to minimize other production expenses. Um, so today I'm going to be sharing with you some data and some thoughts that farmers have shared with me on how we can reduce weed control expenses with cover crops. Um, and more specifically, I'm going to be sharing ideas on first, how we can optimize cover crop seed and application expenses to uh, better control weeds. And then second, how we can use the cover crop to control weeds and uh, limit herbicide expenses. And I'll be sharing, um, I'll be sharing some data uh, that was collected from PFI's cover crop cost share programs. Um, so in 2020, we had um, several privately funded uh, cover crop cost share programs. 
um, throughout the Midwest, but the data that I'm going to be sharing today is primarily going to be from Eastern Nebraska, Iowa, and um, Illinois. And so we asked these cost share participants to fill out a survey for us, and we had just shy of 500 people uh, respond to the survey. And these folks were sharing information on cover crop uh, seeds and application expenses, and then also any changes in expenses of their herbicide programs. Um, oops, skipped ahead here. So um, let's go ahead and get to the findings. There is um, a pretty big range in the cover crop seed and application expenses with the least expensive side kind of being closer to the zero here. There is somebody who is only spending $7 an acre on their cover crop seed and application. They were you know, seeding a lower rate of cereal rye about 30 pounds per acre. And they were just mixing um, that cereal rye seed into their fall fertilizer um, application and the co-op happened to not charge them for it. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, we had people that were spending upwards of uh, $60 an acre um, and these people were typically, you know, hiring their seeding done. Um, these two particular ones that were above 60 um, had a, a custom a drilling operator come out um, and they were uh, both seeding a pretty heavy rate of uh, a cocktail mix. So it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but on average, people were spending, you know, uh, somewhere in the 25 to $30 range an acre. Um, and what I'm not going to do today is say that we all need to be kind of on the, the left hand of this graph, that we shouldn't be spending any money on our cover crop seed and application or minimizing it. Um, rather, I just want to be sharing some of the things that I observed in the data set on how farmers that we work with, that we work with are controlling costs um, while still meeting their production goals and their weed suppression goals. Okay, so let's talk about seed costs. Um, most people were spending kind of in the $750 to $15 an acre range on seed, and the average cost was $13.21. Um, and today we're going to be talking about, you know, weed suppression specifically. So I included a couple bullet points on just things that we want to consider when purchasing seed for uh, weed suppression. So the first thing is that uh, we should limit expenses by probably sticking to a single species, um, like cereal or rye, so that we have a consistent stand across our field. Um, we also want to make sure that we're using an overwintering species um, because we really need that spring growth if we're going to have any sort of weed suppression. Something like oats probably isn't going to really cut it for um, suppressing stuff in the spring. Um, another tip would be to up the seeding rate. So I think Chad said that he was uh, seeding about 40 pounds an acre um, for cereal rye and that worked for him. He's um, you know, we have to experiment on our own farms, but uh, I've heard, you know, upwards of one bushel an acre at the minimum if you're hoping for weed suppression. Um, if you're hoping to do roller crimping, maybe closer to two, two and a half, three bushel an acre, just so you have a really nice, uh, consistent, thick stand of, of cover crops out there. Um, another tip would be to opt for smaller seeded varieties for cereal rye, Elbon's um, one of the smaller seeded variety. And so you know, if you're buying a uh, cover crop by the pound or by the bushel, um, you're going to have more seeds per pound or per bushel if you're um, purchasing a smaller seeded variety such as Elbon. Um, and then a final way that we can kind of minimize our cover crop seed costs um, when we're uh, trying to control weeds is by growing our own seed. So of course, you're going to be capturing that extra profit margin if you're growing your own seed. Um, but Growing your own seed is also helpful because a third crop such as cereal rye that's growing in the winter is gonna to help to break up um, the weed life cycles, I guess, of those uh, annual weeds that would typically grow in the winter, our winter annuals. Um, and so that'd be another really uh, important tool, I guess, for weed suppression. Next, let's go over some cover crop application considerations for uh, weed control. Um, again, uh, there's a pretty big range in how much people were spending on application, but um, average application was around $13.50 an acre. Um, there are quite a few people that were spending less than $5 an acre, um, and those people were typically coupling their cover crop seed application with some other pass. So um, they were mixing their cover crop seed in with their fall fertilizer. Um, they were uh, mounting an air seeder onto their vertical tillage implement. Um, some people even had a, a, one family had a drill combine and so they were kind of using the same uh, pass for uh, both harvest and, and seeding their cover crop. But again, if we're going to be going for weed suppression, um, 
having a nice uh, consistent stand is going to be important. And so I would kind of urge us to think more about um, either drilling or using a method like ground over seeding with a high boy, um, which is going to be helpful for both precision and early growth. Um, something like aerially seeding with an airplane is going to kind of leave some spots. It doesn't necessarily have to if you've got a good uh, pilot, maybe they can cover the entire field consistently, but typically there are often gaps. And I just want to remind us that these ideas that I'm sharing for seeding application costs um, are if our primary goal is weed suppression, but you know, on your farm, you might have a very different goal of you want to have grazing or um, you know, you want to fix nitrogen or maybe just soil health, water quality in general. And so I just urge all of us to, um, you know, think about what our farm specific goals with cover crops are, and then kind of uh, adjust your seed and application plan according to your specific goals. Um, so what about weed suppression? Um, on my job, I get to do a lot of phone calls with farmers who are using cover crops and um, something that I hear often uh, is that, you know, folks are seeing less volunteer corn in their soybean fields after they're using cover crops and they're seeing less weed pressure overall. And more specifically, people have been reporting less weed pressure on some of the species which are developing resistance to our current herbicide modes of action. You know, our herbicide resistant weeds like water hemp, mare's tail, giant ragweed, et cetera. Um, and so cover crops are gonna be a really important tool for controlling these weeds as our um, chemistries kind of lose efficacy and, you know, of course, we are hopeful that there are going to be new chemistries developed that are going to help to control these herbicide resistant weeds, but um, it's likely that eventually we'll see a little bit of tolerance to these new chemistries as well. And so, you know, cover crops are going to be a really critical tool for, for controlling weeds. And so we asked those 500 or so farmers who are in the cost share program, you know, what have you been observing with cover crops and weed suppression? My mouse is glitchy today, I'm slipping forward. Um, and so we asked them, have you observed changes to weed pressure since you began using cover crops? And a handful of people said that they've observed increased weed pressure. Um, this could be, you know, maybe weed seed that was coming in with the cover crop seed, or it could just be um, increased weed pressure in general in their fields. We don't exactly know why those people were seeing increased weed pressure. Um, about 40% of people said that no, they're seeing the same amount of weed pressure. And then nearly 60% of people said that they were seeing uh, decreased weed pressure. And just because, you know, our respondent said it was true doesn't mean that this is fact. Um, but the farmers that I work with are pretty observant people. So I think we can probably trust that weed pressure um, has been decreasing on their field since they began using cover crops. Um, and this is, again, going to be really important for long term productivity, but um, our annual budgets aren't necessarily looking at our long-term weed seed bank. And so when we're thinking about farm financials, we are typically thinking in a calendar year or a growing season. Um, and so we wanted to know how people were changing their herbicide expenses with cover crops. So their herbicide expenses specifically. Um, and we've heard of people that are doing this successfully. For instance, um, Sam Bennett, who is a fellow Northwest Iowan uh, from Galva, Iowa, has been using cover crops to reduce his herbicide expenses in soybean production. Um, I've shared this slide many times. You've probably already heard about Sam's experiments, but he conducted a trial with PFI's cooperators program um, with randomized replicated strips of two treatments. Um, one, he had just his uh, typical herbicide program. And then uh, the, the other treatment, I guess, was uh, leaving out a residual herbicide product um, in some strips on the same field. And, um, you know, he left out the, the residual herbicide product um, and he saw no negative yield impact. So same yield um, with the residual herbicide and without. And so, um, you know, he saved $16 an acre by doing that, which is gonna help to start kind of cut into our seed and application costs. And we wondered, you know, are other people doing this as well? Is this just a rogue farmer who is cutting herbicide expenses or, you know, do we have other folks who are doing this as well? And um, I guess I would be curious to hear from, from you guys. Um, let's try to make this a little bit interactive even though we're virtual. Um, why don't you go ahead and open up the comment box or excuse me, the chat box, and then you can share, you know, are you reducing herbicide um, expenses? Are you like 
minimizing passes or cutting back on product? And if so, how are you doing that? Because, you know, I've got a couple examples, but um, I'd really love to hear from you, from you people as well. So um, anyway, so for reduced herbicide expenses, cover crop compared to the non-cover crop, which inclu includes the herbicide products and passes, um, about 22% of people were reducing herbicide costs with cover crops. So Sam's not alone in this. Um, nearly a fifth of, of the farmers who were cover cropping their soybean farmers, or excuse me, that were cover cropping their soybean fields um, were reducing herbicide expenses, either the herbicide product or the passes to soybeans with cover crops. And on average, they were saving about 13.50 an acre. So kind of similar to Sam's savings. And, um, you know, again, that's kind of help us to kind of cut back into those upfront costs of, of seed and application. And then we asked the same question for cover cropped versus non-cover cropped corn. And we found that about 10% of people uh, were reducing herbicide expenses with cover crops um, in their corn. And the average saving was a little bit less. It was closer to about 1050 an acre. And so if we wanna be saving herbicide expenses, you know, what is it that we need to be doing? You know, you probably can't just like blindly cut things out. Um, and I think what we should start with is uh, the most simple system is just cereal rye ahead of soybean because soybeans tend to be a little bit more forgiving and rye with its aggressive spring growth is gonna give us a really nice uh, weed suppressing mulch. Um, and our weed suppression plan really starts in the fall. So again, we've already kind of touched on this, but seeding a really uniform stand, um, probably drilling or overseeding. Um, I've heard mixed results about uh, seeding with your fall fertilizer. Some people say that it gives them a consistent enough stand for weed suppression. Some people say that it's kind of gappy, um, but again, probably avoiding uh, aerial application with, with an airplane. Um, more biomass helps. So, you know, a higher seeding rate in the fall, um, earlier seeding date is going to help. And I think probably the most critical piece of this is the later termination, because again, most of our cover crop growth is going to be in the warm spring. And so later termination is really helpful for that. And Chad touched on this as well, but you know, if you're going to be moving from a, a three pass system to a two pass system or two pass system to a one pass system or um, leaving out residual or maybe just using one um, burn down product, then you might uh, need to do a little bit of spot spraying kind of on the problematic areas, the field edges and where your cover crop did not have a consistent stand. Um, and then I didn't include this on the slide, but uh, I think we should also just keep our expectations realistic. Uh, some years, you know, we're going to have great cover crop growth and we're going to have great weed suppression. Um, but falls like last year, you know, in my part of the state, we had pretty low uh, subsoil moisture. And so we're probably going to have, we, we did have issues with cover crop establishment. I've heard that from a few people in, in our area. Um, and so we're probably not necessarily going to get a great enough cover crop stand to use it for weed suppression. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. It's not necessarily going to be something that you can bank on every year. Okay, so some people are saving on herbicide expenses, but there's another side to that coin. Um, there are also some people, especially folks that are brand new to cover crops, that are spending more on herbicides with cover crops. Um, and we observed with soybeans, uh, which is the green color here, that 8% of people were applying more herbicide or um, making additional herbicide passes on their cover cropped fields. And uh, with corn, we had more people. We had 17% of people who were increasing their herbicide product and passes with cover crops. And so there's still some work to do here. Um, but again, I would invite folks to share in the chat, you know, um, this is a question that I get sometimes from folks that are brand new to cover crops, you know, I don't want to spend extra on herbicide. So what, what do you guys advise for um, kind of minimizing herbicide costs? Uh, if you're brand new, not reducing them, but just keeping them kind of at the same level. And I'll go over some of the things that I've already learned. But um, yeah, so the basic principle for avoiding additional herbicide costs with cover crops is that we can just use our existing um, herbicide program and just kind of tweak it a little bit to better fit the system with the cover crops. So our cover crop uh, termination does not need an extra pass. Um, for corn, our termination is probably going to be the same pass as our pre-emerge or pre-plant herbicide pass and just, you know, making sure that glyphosate is in that pass, of course. 
um, for soybeans, I'm talking about cereal rye termination specifically, I should uh, qualify that. For soybeans, our cover crop termination might be in our post-emerge pass, um, or some people will even terminate right after planting. But for both of these, we don't need to be um, using additional products or passes. But to avoid any hiccups, we really need to keep in mind uh, some of the same best practices that we're using for you know, weed management. It's cover crop, if you let it go too long, it's just a weed. So um, you know, we should be spraying on warm sunny days when nighttime temperatures aren't too cool. Um, ideally in the afternoon when the rye is actively growing and uptaking that herbicide product, metabolizing it and eventually you know, it'll, it'll die. Um, we want to use a typical burn down rate of glyphosate for CRI, so you know, one pound acid equivalent per acre glyphosate. Um, that's, uh, Chad said, 32 ounces of, of Roundup. Um, you know, if you're not using Roundup, if you're using a different brand, brand name, just make sure that you've got at least one pound acid equivalent there. And then a last tip, and this is one that people kind of forget about, especially folks that are brand new to cover crops, is that we should probably avoid using a carrier of greater than 15 gallons an acre um, because that can kind of overly dilute our herbicide product and cause our um, cover crop to not uh, effectively uptake it. And then finally, I also forgot to include this on the slide, it looks like, but um, some people have had success with adding AMS to the mix. They say that the cover crop um, uptakes the herbicide better if, if there's some AMS in the mix. Okay, so if we stack the cover crop seed and application costs with the changes to herbicide expenses, what does our partial budget look like? Um, and this graph is for soybeans, so cover crop partial budget going to soybeans as a function of reduced equivalent or added herbicide expenses. Um, and the green curve here is uh, showing the distribution of people who are cutting herbicide costs with cover crops. Um, and you, you can see that people who are cutting herbicide expenses had, you know, a partial budget closer to $16 an acre. In general, they're all um, closer to the left. So they're spending less on their cover crop acres, or excuse me, on their cover cropped fields. Um, and there are quite a few people that were kind of under, you know, the $10 line, which is maybe about right here. And we know that with our cover crop program, which was $10 an acre, um, that would actually make their cover cropping a net positive practice. And I'll also say that most people in our cover crop program uh, in our privately funded cover crop program are also enrolled in a couple of uh, publicly funded uh, cover crop programs as well. So um, certainly with uh, cost share, people uh, who were reducing herbicide expenses were uh, typically had a net positive impact for, um, for their cover crop. Okay, so wrapping up here, just a couple of take home messages on optimizing um, our cover crops for weed suppression. Um, we should establish clear cover crop goals, know exactly what we're trying to accomplish, whether that's for grazing or weed suppression or, or both. Um, and then we should consider how we can optimize seed and application expenses. So not necessarily always going for the cheapest option. Sometime we'll spend a little bit more, but get additional benefit. Um, and then uh, thirdly, and lastly, we, I need to think through how we can reduce other production costs um, with the cover crop. So, you know, today I was talking mostly about herbicide product, reducing herbicide product, um, but some people are able to, you know, reduce tillage, which is going to save them $20, $25 an acre, um, or recoup some of the costs via grazing or mechanical, mechanically harvested forage. And then lastly, I just want to say thanks to uh, the folks on the PFI team who uh, were critical in, in putting this together. So Lydia, uh, who is facilitating today, uh, put together most of the data visuals for us. Uh, Sarah advised on the project. And then Chris Wilbeck and Amy Roberts were really critical in um, kind of managing the receipt verification process with me. So um, if you've got any questions, comments, or ideas uh, beyond what I shared, or if you think I'm totally off kilter, I'd love to hear them either later in the Q&A or you can also reach out to me at uh, Rebecca at practicalfarmers.org. Um, so I'll leave my slide up for now in case anybody wants to jot down my email. But Lydia, what, what did we have coming through the chat box? Yeah, thanks, Becca. That was really great. Um, there's uh, 
a, I have a question and then a couple comments I want to share and folks should continue um, as Becca mentioned folks should continue to share if they're comfortable their experiences um, with uh, cover crops and weed control and cutting costs or, or not uh, in the chat box so we can all learn from each other but um, a quick question for you first Becca is um, for the Van Zanti project, were you able to collect like nitrogen management and application rates as well as collecting the tiles so you knew, you know, how much N folks were applying in those different sub watersheds or were, did we were, were we not able to get that information? Yeah. Um, so we were working with Iowa Soybean Association and they did collect, um, you know, fertility management practices. Um, I don't think I have that data uh, with me right now, so I can't share that with you, but you know, when we were looking at the, the stream segments in, um, in the four different sub watersheds, you maybe you noticed that um, the highest uh, percentage of cover crop coverage actually didn't have the lowest um, nitrate load. And, you know, that could have been because of uh, people were applying higher end rates um, in that sub watershed. It could have also been because uh, upstream practices, like at the stream source, uh, were maybe different. They weren't necessarily. 62% uh, cover crop. So um, yeah, I, you know, cover crops are definitely reducing nitrates uh, that are coming from our tile, but um, it's a little bit more nuanced with stream segments. Definitely. Um, a couple comments that I don't know if you want to also expound upon, but just want to share with the whole group if anyone's not seen the chat box. Um, Nathan shared that he can reduce herbicide expenses, but it is very dependent on getting a consistent stand, which is sort of what you're saying too. So year to year, we might not be able to always reduce expenses and especially in a drought year, um, but a good stand does make it possible possible for him to eliminate a pass uh, or an herbicide from the program. Yeah, absolutely, Nathan. I think I uh, pulled that idea from some email correspondence with you. So <laughs> yeah, some years, some years we can get it. But And then Emery shared that last spring, the, um, we sprayed a burn down to kill rye and uh, about half the soybean acres needed a second pass, but the other half had enough rye to suppress weeds and scouting was definitely important to figuring out where they needed to apply more. Awesome, Emery. Yeah. I think, you know, that's kind of the, the gold standard is kind of moving to uh, a one pass system. It's going to save us quite a bit. Um, and so it's great that your field happened to kind of work out that it was like half and half that, uh, that you um, only had to apply on, on or do a second pass on, on half of the field. But um, yeah, I think it takes a little bit more labor. Um, but if you've got the time to do scouting, um, then you can probably save some money with it. So kind of it's gonna depend on, on what your farm system is. And two other comments I wanna just briefly share. One from Dave that he basically switched to a no-till concurrently with starting using cover crops. So as you mentioned at the end here, you know, he's spending more on herbicides, but saving on tillage costs. So in the end, you know, it, it might actually be the same or, or more saving money because of, of that expense. Great. And the last one is also from Nathan. I'm not sure if you have a comment on this, but he mentioned that corn residual herbicides that are labeled to allow cover crop establishment later in the year or grazing especially are often more expensive than commonly used corn residual herbicides that aren't as comparable with cover crops. Um, mm. Do you, have you heard that um, from other growers as well? Or is that something you've noticed or? No, yeah, that's the first that I've heard of that Nathan. And I'd love for you to kind of expand on that a little bit more when you do your presentation. Um, but yeah, that is also something that I didn't mention, I guess, in, uh, in the presentation is uh, not all, some cover crops are really sensitive to um, herbicides that we would have applied for our cash crop production. And so that's one thing to consider as well um, when you're thinking about your herbicide program is, you know, how does this fit with my cover crop uh, establishment? Um, if it costs more money, yeah, I... Uh, I hadn't heard that, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about that later on. So um, anyway, I will wrap it up. I think I'm a little bit over time, but uh, uh, thanks everyone. And I'm looking forward to hearing from Nathan and, and Keaton later on here. <laughs>